Good evening and welcome to the last presentation of this year's Perfect Science Week. I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Naz Direkshan, who is the director of one of Birkbeck's new research centres, that is the Building Resilience in Breast Cancer Research Centre, which was approved a research committee only this term. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what the centre is about and the interesting research that Naz has already done to get the centre set up. So, Naz. Thank you so much, Nick, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you for coming. It was seven o'clock, so I think people want to go home. Um, so I'll be spending the talk concentrating on um, one of the most common malignancies in women worldwide, um, breast cancer, and exploring the possibilities that a new upcoming research field of neurocognitive neuroscience um, what can it do to build resilience in um, breast cancer survivorship? And I'll be talking about BRIC, Building Resilience in Breast Cancer Centre as well. So what is breast cancer? Breast cancer is cancer that is situated in the breast. Um, as you can see on the slide, um, the cancer cells can develop within the milk ducts. Um, but also can migrate outside the ducts um, and form lumps, or, uh, which we call tumours, um, which uh, can also migrate via um, the blood, so cancer cells can uh, go around the body um, uh, using a method called intravascular invasion, or via the lymph nodes. Oh, oops that you can see um, there, those green um, nodes there. So breast cancer um, starts within the breast or under the arm, uh, the lymph nodes. It can be situated within the breast or it can, and with more aggressive types, it can travel around the body um, and home into various organs such as the bones, um, brain, lung and liver. Um, there are various signs of breast cancer that um, people notice uh, before um, consulting uh, physicians. Of course, the tumour, um, which can be a lump uh, or a hard knot or thickening inside the breast or underarm, um, swelling, darkening, uh, warm area on the breast, change in shape or size of the breast, dimpling of the skin, itchy, scaly score, sore skin, pulling in of the nipple, discharge, and new pain in a spot that doesn't go away. So you can see there's so many different signs, uh, signs of breast cancer, um, and many of which that can go unnoticed. There are various stages and grades within breast cancer. Um, so the stage zero that you can see there on the left is uh, quite a, um, a low stage. Uh, and as you move up stage one, two, three, and four, um, you see that the breast cancer has become um, more uh, uh, metastasized within the um, other organs like stage 4 um, and hit, has hit the lymph nodes within stage 3 and 3, 3B and 3A um, and also lymph nodes um, here stage 2. So, so when it's stage 4, it's metastatic breast cancer um, that has spread to other parts of the body and is incurable, um, whereas it's treatable but incurable. There are 15 different types of breast cancer. Um, the majority of the breast cancers respond to uh, hormones, so they grow on oestrogen and progesterone, so 65 to 75% of the um, uh, tumours uh, are usually progesterone um, and oestrogen uh, receptor positive. <coughs> We've got um, uh, a smaller percentage that respond to the HER2 protein um, and uh, triple negative, which is kind of like one of the most aggressive um, but uh, the, not, not, respond, not responsive to progesterone, oestrogen or the HER2. Uh, positive and triple negative is um, uh, one of the most feared types of breast cancer although all types of breast cancer um, are uh, to be feared of. 
In the UK alone, every 10 minutes a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, there's a 75% increase in rates since the 1970s. And so there are increasing rates in younger women as well. So this is a phenomenon that we really need to take very, very seriously. So just a few facts about breast cancer and then I'll move on to um, uh, talk about some of the emotional vulnerability symptoms and cognitive vulnerability, vulnerability symptoms um, that women with breast cancer experience. So breast cancer is the biggest malignancy in women worldwide. Every day in the UK, 150 women are diagnosed. It's a highly complex, it's a heterogeneous and multifactorial um, disease. So there is no one cause for breast cancer. Uh, a number of factors within a particular package um, give rise um, to the development of breast cancer. The escalating rates in younger premenopausal women, um, and we find that younger premenopausal women with breast cancer diagnosis have more of the aggressive type, so those um, stage three, stage four, but also higher grade, so the, the rate by which their cells multiply are, are higher in, in the younger premenopausal women. Breast cancer is uh, targeted using surgery, so nearly everyone um, has surgery to remove the lump or the breast um, if you need a mastectomy. Uh, followed by chemotherapy, which is quite a harsh um, treatment, um, and radiotherapy, which is localised around um, the breast area. Then those breast cancers that are responsive to um, uh, hormonal um, treatments undergo endocrine therapy. So, for example, tamoxifen is a pill um, that most women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers take for a period of 10 years after um, uh, their chemotherapy. 30% of women with a primary diagnosis of breast cancer go on to develop secondary breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer. So um, this is recurrence, breast cancer recurrence. So one in three are at high risk of um, recurrence. And um, a very small percentage um, of breast cancers are explained by genetic mutations, such as the BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, mutations. Uh, so it's a very, very complex uh, cancer um, and there is no known particular pathway, specific factor that can be totally responsible for it. Okay. So most women with breast cancer, when they enter survivorship, post-active treatment, suffer high levels of chronic depression and anxiety. Um, uh, very high rates of PTSD are seen and they also suffer chronic fatigue. <coughs> um, they report uh, high levels of impaired quality of life, they experience social withdrawal, social isolation, lack of self-esteem and self-confidence which is battered basically. It's uh, very interesting, um, people feel that after active treatment um, that you know, the cancer's toast and so you're back on your feet to kind of um, go, go back in the world um, and do what you were doing before. But there's li little realisation that you are toast as well as a function of the trauma of diagnosis and the harsh treatments that you've been um, experiencing. Age of diagnosis is the biggest predictor of psychological distress. Um, so the younger you are, the greater psychological distress you report because the implications of having breast cancer for younger women if they have children, they have full-time jobs, um, so the implications are greater. Fear of recurrence is one of the biggest, um, uh, I don't want to say disabilities, but it's, it's a mental um, uh, preoccupation that women continue to experience on a daily basis, um, and as a consequence, they can get intrusive thoughts about fears of recurrence um, uh, quite spontaneously. Radical menopausal symptoms, especially in premenopausal women, um, lead to fertility incapacity, um, impair parenting responsibilities, um, because, as we know, most of the breast cancer um, tumours are oestrogen receptor positive, so um, the radical menopausal on symptom onset um, is, is a big threat to, um, to, to womanhood, in fact which takes us back to the next box. 
Um, there is a lack of sexual desire, you're deprived of estrogen <laughs> through tamoxifen and various other kinds of endocrine therapy. Um, uh, women report quite a number of sexual um, uh, problems, intimacy issues, um, and as one of um, my group members uh, said very nicely, breast cancer has robbed me of my womanhood. Um, there is the physical unattractiveness that goes with the emotional vulnerability, and so it's a double whammy really, the, um, the escalating problems that uh, this population experiences. But there's also cognitive vulnerability. Um, something that I'm going to focus on quite a bit from now um, is the evidence that points to reductions in brain structure and function even prior to treatment. So chemotherapy, as a result of chemotherapy and treatment, there are changes in the brain that occur uh, post-active treatment. And um, these reductions, uh, changes in brain structure and function, have being seen even prior to chemotherapy. Most um, of physicians and psychologists believe that this is due to the traumatic nature of diagnosis and um, uh, change in, in um, a life and a life-changing disease that kind of plagues your life. The brain dysfunction is exaggerated after treatment, especially after chemotherapy, so we see the biggest effects of cognitive vulnerability after chemo. Women report impairments in concentration, everyday memory, they're easily distracted, they find it difficult to hold information in working memory. Um, and these uh, symptoms are exaggerated um, due to the lack of estrogen. Estrogen is a very important hormone for cognitive function, for brain function. Um, and so it exaggerates um, the effects of cognitive decline. Something that I'm going to focus on quite a bit is the notion of impaired processing efficiency. So different parts of the brain are supposed to communicate together efficiently are rather um, impaired and inefficient in doing so, which um, again puts another dent um, on the brain. And of course, Cognitive dysfunction and cognitive difficulties exaggerate psychological distress. We need to um, look at cognitive health and emotional health as one package. You can't separate the two. So when you're cognitively impaired and cognitive, experience cognitive difficulties, um, of course you feel incompetent, you feel distressed, and so psychological distress is elevated in the individual. So what are these signs of cognitive vulnerability and their impact? So you must have heard of chemo brain or chemo fog, which is the term that we usually use for this cognitive uh, fuzziness and impaired concentration, impaired processing efficiency. So it includes memory loss, forgetting names, difficulty forming sentences, struggling to concentrate, to follow conversations, which, is, which has a huge impact, for example, in the workplace. So your treatment has ended and you're, you're back to your workplace, um, trying to um, build uh, what you think has been destroyed through your breast cancer treatment, but then you find it difficult to keep up with me meetings um, and so forth. <coughs> Difficulty holding information in working memory and manipulating information in working memory. Lapses in attention, these are very, very common. And one thing that exaggerates chemo um, brain effects is fatigue. So as a consequence of all these cognitive difficulties, what we're doing is we try harder. Women try harder and invest more effort. So you naturally become tired. Fatigue worsens chemo brain, but then chemo brain also worsens fatigue. So it's a bi-directional relationship. So there is no doubt that chemo fog, chemo brain, impairs self-esteem, impairs self-confidence. Um, competency in personal, social and work life. Women report that they're isolated, they don't want to go out, they get tired very quickly. Um, and something that I'd like to flag up and emphasise um, hereafter is that chemo brain enhances vulnerability to clinical anxiety and depression. Indeed, the rates of clinical anxiety and depression in survivorship, breast cancer survivorship, um, are quite high. So what has the evidence showed? As you can see here, I've, um, I've done a graph to encapsulate the relationship between perceived cognitive competency and anxiety and depression. So as um, you uh, 
perceive your cognitive competency to be high, your anxiety and depression levels would be lower. So there's a negative relationship between the two. This is what the literature has shown um, quite repeatedly. Um, not only anxiety and depression, but impaired quality of life and PTSD. So there is this link, very strong link, of um, co cognitive competency uh, correlating negatively with um, uh, emotional vulnerability. We wanted to see um, what were the possible moderators of this relationship. So for example, we know that there are um, different grades of breast cancer, different stages of breast cancer, age of diagnosis seems to be predicting psychological distress and so forth. So in a, um, a very competent MSc project um, uh, that I supervised uh, last year, um, we looked at uh, possible moderators of this relationship, cognitive vulnerability and emotional vulnerability. We had a large sample of women, mostly who were um, a prime, had a primary diagnosis of breast cancer. They were um, uh, mean age of diagnosis 45, that's quite young um, for breast cancer. And um, the, they had mostly invasive cancers, so cancer that had um, uh, gone to the lymph nodes, um, or was that they had, we had more high grade versus moderate grade versus low grade um, breast cancers in the sample. And um, everyone completed questionnaires or cancer related um, and general emotional vulnerability, anxiety, depression, quality of life, and cognitive vulnerability um, measures. And so we were interested to see whether these factors, what you can see, grade of breast cancer, endocrine therapy status, age of diagnosis, and time since diagnosis, moderated the relationship between cognitive vulnerability and emotional vulnerability. So a moderator, just to kind of remind ourselves what a moderator is, is a variable that can either increase the effect of one variable on the other, so it can either increase the effects of cognitive vulnerability or emotional vulnerability, reduce it, or reverse it. So that's what a moderator is. Um, and so we hypothesise that the higher the grade of the breast cancer, of course, because there is more at stake, breast cancer is rapidly um, progressing and there may be a really high chance of recurrence, so cognitive vulnerability effects would be greater on emotional vulnerability. But of course, we had similar hypotheses for endocrine therapy, age, uh, time six diagnosis and so forth. And what we found very interestingly um, was that uh, if, if we have a look at the x-axis below, um, you've got low, mean and high levels of perceived cognitive function. And on the y-axis, you've got predicted level of emotional vulnerability. The blue lines are the grade 1 cancers, the green line are the grade 2 cancers, and the grade 3 cancers are the red dotted lines. So you can see the moderation occurs uh, really here, where breast cancer grades moderated the level of uh, perceived cognitive function effect on emotional vulnerability. Um, and the greatest effect here you can see for the higher grades, where the, um, the lower perceived cognitive function results in the greater um, emotional vulnerability. Um, whereas the high perceived cognitive function um, here with low levels of emotional vulnerability. So grade of breast cancer moderated this relationship um, as we expected. We didn't find moderation with any of the other variables. The work is still in progress. So quite a lot of the medical profession have questioned whether chemo brain is actually real or not. Um, so we're going to question that as well, uh, but also talk about some evidence that points um, to it being real. Research shows that cognitive impairments and attention, learning and memory you can find in about 15 to 75% of breast cancer patients following chemotherapy. This is a large, wide window, yeah? so we've got a big range there, 15 to 75%. Some have it more, others have it less, and we are at the moment trying to find out what our, what, how we can find, how can we examine um, the possible factors that can contribute to such diversity. The things that are quite heavily reported in the literature being impaired are verbal learning, memory impairments shortly after treatment. 
but also after a longer time of 20 years. So while the brain is trying to heal itself in terms of reductions in brain structure and function, it's quite hard. You can see these problems up to 20 years post-chemotherapy, post-active treatment. MRI evidence shows structural changes in white and grey matter in the brain up to 21 years post-active treatment. With medical advances, more women are surviving. But it comes, this comes to psychological cost because we are continuing to be suffering from such um, uh, cognitive vulnerabilities in brain um, structure and function. And also research shows that there is hyper-responsiveness, but it's not really clear whether this is hyper or hypo. It changes across time. A various parts of the brain parietal cortex related to attentional difficulties up to 10 years post-chemotherapy. So we're getting a feeling that these effects are sustained over time, well beyond chemotherapy. So how can we really target our understanding of what is happening over time. There must be many fluctuations um, going on that can help us explain these different patterns of sub-reports of chemo brain um, across time. So quite a big line of my work within BRIC is to understand the nature and trajectory of neurocognitive change. Why is this important? Why are we looking at this? Because understanding this traje trajectory, the development of neurocognitive change over time can give us a window into understanding how and when emotional vulnerability is at stake, who is at a higher risk of developing cognitive difficulties and so forth. So I really like this picture of the brain. Um, you can see various colourful blobs on it. Um, it's very, very simplified, of course. So you've got the front of the brain there, where you've got the, the green block, the prefrontal cortex, which is really responsible for quite a lot of our everyday activities, as well as challenging um, tasks that we do, working memory, and concentration, thinking, um, and inhibiting irrelevant material, and so forth. Um, it's basically stemming from there, but you've got the anterior cingulate cortex here that also communicates with the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala, this red um, fiery kind of almond-shaped organ, um, is very, it's like the emotional hub of the brain, which signals to the prefrontal cortex, there's danger, we need to act. The fight-flight kind of response. So emotional vulnerability weighs heavy on the amygdala. The parietal cortex, the visual cortex, of course, is very important because it projects information to the amygdala and to the anterior cingulate cortex. So these systems work in harmony so that we can understand, appreciate, appraise various kinds of things that we are, we're going through and we're dealing with. The communication between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex is key, which is supervised by the cingulate cortex, um, the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is very much studied within emotional vulnerability, cognitive vulnerability um, relationship outside of the breast cancer population. This is a lot of the work that we do um, uh, at Birkbeck. So, some of the brain activation patterns um, now that we see in women uh, who are, who've undergone breast cancer treatment and a diagnosis. So this was a study, one of my favourite studies actually, um, that was published not that long ago in 2012, where um, they looked at increased bre looked at brain activation whilst um, participants were performing a working memory task that was challenging, so they involved quite a lot of the prefrontal cortex activation. And they tested breast cancer patients versus healthy controls with no history of breast cancer. And what they found, that they had three groups of uh, people, the healthy controls down here, the, um, the women who didn't have chemo, and the women who did have chemo. 
therapy. So the blue bars are for the um, activity at baseline. Activity at baseline, this is immediately after surgery, quite a lot of activity here compared with very little activity here in the healthy controls. One month after chemo, and this is a match at the oath intervals, very little activity in the group who had chemo and quite a bit in the group who didn't have chemo relative to healthy controls. This is at one year follow-up. They're hyper-responsive at one year follow-up, the two breast cancer groups, relative to healthy controls. And I've said no to the trajectory of change. Now, very interestingly, this is in the absence of any behavioural effects. So behaviour-wise, when they are pressing buttons indicating what should be where and solving the problem, there is no difference. But at a brain level, there are huge differences. Hyperactivation at the cost of no behavioural difference. So, important information. Again, um, another study looking at brain activation, um, similar kind of uh, logic, but when people were completing Tower of London task um, that was manipulated in loads, and you can see that women with breast cancer have greater prefrontal activity compared with um, no cancer controls. But also the role of fatigue was looked at here and it was found that that moderated the extra activity that um, breast cancer patients showed. Again, um, by the same group, um, looking at the uh, effects of systemic therapy after chemotherapy, so looking at the effects of like, things like tamoxifen, um, women who've gone under, undergone chemotherapy and tamoxifen, and um, looking at their brain activity, which is very similar um, to what we saw before. Um, however, the, uh, the group with um, only breast cancer and no systemic therapy show hypoactivation, but the one with systemic therapy show hyperactivation. So there's a mixture, really, of what's happening depending on when people are tested across the trajectory post-diagnosis. So we really need to get a better handle of what's happening using more precise measures, electrophysiological measures, that can pin out, tease down, time locked by the event to see exactly what's happening in terms of um, hypo versus hyperactivation. So we've come to call this, in fact not just us, but the literature has called it a hidden cost. Now the hidden cost comes from the anxiety literature, which um, I introduced, um, but the compensatory effort is what the researchers are arguing about within the breast cancer population. So breast cancer um, patients have to recruit more, they have to compensate for the inefficiency that they are experiencing brain-wise, and so the notion of compensatory effort, more fatigue, that bi-directional relationship. Why is this a hidden cost? It's a hidden cost because I can't see it behaviour-wise. When I get them in the lab, they perform similar. But brain activity shows that they're trying harder to get where the healthy controls are. So how can we target this hidden cost in breast cancer? Perhaps through um, the various kinds of um, uh, interventions we can possibly target this. But we need to be able to measure it properly first and understand its trajectory and then target it through an intervention that can boost cognitive efficiency. But we've seen this compensatory effort before. So um, before I became interested in the breast cancer research, uh, which was up to 2013, um, I was heavily involved in understanding the neurocognitive correlates of impaired cognitive function um, and emotional vulnerability in anxiety and depression. So that many, many years working on um, finding a causal mechanism within the brain that can explain emotional vulnerability in anxiety and depression. And the hallmark um, finding of that research was that we were able to 
um, determine um, using many, many years of research that impaired processing efficiency can be a, actually one of the biggest risk factors for the development and maintenance of anxiety and depression. And we have review papers and, uh, on this and many different types of theoretical papers as well as experimental papers. So, cognitively, if I'm not very able, if I'm impaired, and if my different parts of my brain are not communicating with each other properly, then what am I going to end up doing? I'm going to end up letting anxiety thoughts, related thoughts, depressive related thoughts, clog up my working memory because they do what? They get precedence. Um, and through my bias towards um, these symptomatologies, um, I become more sluggish through time. I can't get things out of my head. I tend to ruminate. I worry. And these take up resources of my working memory and make me feel inefficient and sluggish. This is what we have determined within the anxiety and depression literature. And it really all started, uh, well actually escalated, a few years ago when we introduced the attention control theory. And so we argued, so remember the brain that I showed with the emotional hub and the prefrontal hub, which is like the thinking hub? So marry back onto this seesaw, the stimulus-driven attention um, system and the goal-directed attention system. So the stimulus-driven being the emotional one, the emotional hub amygdala, and the goal-directed being the anterior prefrontal cortex. And so we argued that Anxiety and depression bias the brain system towards emotional um, vulnerability, uh, hypervigilance for threat, a, a preference to process negative material, um, and against the goal-directed system. As a consequence of this imbalance, there is the recruitment of compensatory additional cognitive resources to balance this imbalance out. And so this was an important prediction of the theory which we then substantiated using electrophysiological measures. Um, and we did this by recording brain activity um, using electrode caps like that. You can see the, um, this person is getting ready to um, uh, uh, prepare the participants uh, for the study um, and we record brain activity from these different parts of the brain. Why do we like this and um, prefer it to fMRI? fMRI gives a lovely spatial resolution but very bad temporal resolution um, of the brain. Um, this gives us a better temporal resolution. We can look at moment by moment so that we can get a detailed understanding of how those moment-by-moment -moment changes map onto the behavioural outcomes like errors and reaction times that we see. They're very sensitive, yeah, those errors and reaction time data. So we need proper, good, high temporal resolution electrophysiological measures. And so we measured this hidden cost of anxiety using a task that um, I was very fond of, I still am very fond of, called the anti saccade task, which measures inhibition. What participants do is that they see a blood flash at them very, very quickly. They're asked not to look at the blood, but to look to its opposite position on the screen immediately, as soon as possible. So you need to inhibit, but then generate a saccade to the other side of the screen. So inhibition is involved. Working memory is involved. Cognitive efficiency is involved. And what we did, we measured what happened in the brain between offset of this cross and the onset of the blob. And we hypothesized that anxious individuals, high anxious individuals who report high levels of anxiety, would show greater levels of prefrontal activation just before the onset of the blob to inhibit the to be inhibited blob compared with low anxious people. And this is exactly what we saw. If we look at the grey area here, this is the Q offset. This is when the cross goes off. This is when the target comes on, the block. And the blue lines are the high anxious, the, low, the red lines are the low anxious. 
We looked at something called the CNV contingent negative variation of the ERP, ele electro um, physiological response, and it's a negative deflection, so it's down. Greater resources recruited by high anxious people frontally relative to low anxious people at the absence of errors made on the anti cicatus. So this was the first demonstration of its kind, the CNV, the hidden cost of anxiety, and we have replicated this using many different paradigms. When we're required to inhibit, we are using the executive functions of working memory quite a lot. So if I ask you to color name these words, you have to inhibit the actual word green and say red. It's quite hard, isn't it? I usually fail. <laughs> um, so in an experiment, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is quite heavily involved in inhibiting irrelevant um, stuff, was measured, frontal activity was measured, when requiring to inhibit in that task. Of course, you had words in colours that were congruent and words in colours that were incongruent. And what was found was that high anxious individuals, HA, had greater DLPS, FC activity than low anxious individuals in the absence of any behavioural effects, which they were equal. And this is the brain activity on, on incongruent trials. When I had to do that inhibition, I had to recruit more compared with low anxious people. But I didn't show any differences on the congruent trials. In a subsequent study, um, working memory load was manipulated. So participants' eyes saw a string of letters like that, B, Z, K, R, and then they would say, oh, we'll just maintain the order by which the, these come up, and then say whether R was false or not. Or, I'm going to give you a string of these, I want you to manipulate them alphabetically and then say whether B was second or not. Quite hard. And so the prediction was that um, again, anxiety would modulate DLPFC activity, and that was exactly what was found, but on the more difficult trial. So when I really had to exercise attention control, and I had to exercise cognitive efficiency, I had to recruit more <coughs> than low anxious participants. But when, when it was easy, simply recite, hold the order in your working memory, I don't um, see modulations by anxiety. Worriers compensate too. Um, we have shown this as a function, this compensation as a function of high rumination, high worrying, high levels of anxiety, and we are working on that in depression as well. So, going back to the brain here, are we dealing with a biased system? If we map what we know from the anxiety literature onto now understanding what's going on in with breast cancer, do we have a system where we are biased bottom up against top down? So, with breast cancer, the seesaw actually makes sense because high anxiety being intrusions, fear of recurrence, PTSD symptoms, and emotional vulnerability bias the system. Yes? Of course, it makes sense. It makes absolute sense. Um, and there is a compensation, recruitment of additional cognitive resources. This can come about as a consequence of the trauma, but also chemotherapy, tamoxifen, plaque of estrogen. All of these factors contribute to increasing emotional vulnerability in breast cancer and triggering compensatory recruitment of resources. So we might be thinking, well, is more loss? Uh-oh. No. Neuroscience tells us the brain is plastic. And this is a recent discovery in neuroscience. 
um, something that researchers are very, very excited about. So what is neuroplasticity? It's been used and defined in many, many different ways, but this is my favourite um, slide on neuroplasticity. And it, it basically says that the brain, through neuroplasticity, can all reorganise itself. And it does this all the time, without effort. It's something that the brain does. Given the environment that you're in, given your experiences, neural connections are built to support those experiences. So in a high anxious brain, the neural networks around the amygdala and the bottom up system, the limbic system, are pretty good hardwired and they are firing. But we need to get a better understanding of how neuroplasticity changes over time. So Neurogenesis is a pathway by which neuroplasticity works. New synapses are built. Good neural connections can be strengthened and bad ones we can get rid of, given the advantage we have from neuroplasticity. So this is a video in just the two minutes that um, is really, really good on neuroplasticity uh, that I'd like to play for you. Oh, not that one, sorry. Uh, I don't know anything about the author, and I don't know what their centre's about. So this is not... Um, oh. Okay, so it's all. This is thought the brain was fixed and high-wired and couldn't change after childhood. But recent research shows this is simply not the case at all. And we know that people's brains can change well into old age. In fact, our brains change every day. Our brains are considered to be plastic or pliable, and this has helped neuroscientists coin the term neuroplasticity. So how does neuroplasticity work? Well, think of your brain as a huge city with thousands of roads and lots and lots of traffic. Some of these roads are faster than others, with lots of traffic moving quickly and easily. These roads with all their traffic represent our established ways of thinking, feeling and doing. Every time we think, feel or do something in the same way, we strengthen this road, making it faster and it becomes quicker and easier for our brains to travel this pathway. But by contrast, if a road wasn't built well in the first place, or becomes blocked, or we think, feel, or do something differently, we start to use a different pathway. If we keep using that new road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and more, and this new way of thinking, feeling, or doing becomes automatic. In the meantime, the old pathway gets less and less use and weakens. In other cases, it may be possible to repair or rebuild the block path. This process of rewiring your brain by strengthening existing pathways, making new ones, weakening old ones, and repairing broken ones is neuroplasticity in action. It is important to understand that neuroplasticity is not good or bad. It is just what the brain does. Neuroplasticity can result in healthful changes, like when a child learns how to cross the road safely, or when an adult learns a new set of work skills. On the other hand, it can result in unhelpful changes in the brain like when someone develops a bad habit or an unhealthy way of thinking. The exciting thing is that scientists are getting better and better at directing neuroplasticity in the brain and developing treatments for conditions that are considered to be previously incurable or at least difficult to fix. Things like ADHD and learning disorders, anxiety, depression, chronic pain and migraines, for example. At the Perth Brain Centre, we've helped thousands of people over the last 10 years. We have a team of healthcare professionals who are skilled in the use of neuroplasticity. Okay. We aren't advocating. Uh, but I thought that that um, very short video of neuroplasticity uh, was, you know, very informative, very useful. So, given that um, uh, the brain does this naturally and we can intervene and boost the ability um, for neuroplasticity, then we, of course we can exploit it. It's a good opportunity to build resilience um, in uh, breast cancer. So neuroplasticity induced change, what will it give me? It will give me a harmonic system uh, that would balance the stimulus-driven, goal-directed system in ways that it would reduce the bias. So if you think of the seesaw going up and down, this adaptation is key to 
balancing um, the, uh, the, the network activity that is involved in um, uh, the homeostasis of the brain, the emotional system, the cognitive system, being in harmony, the balance. So how can we achieve this? Well, you must think there are uh, therapies like CBT, mindfulness, um, talking therapies. They're all very good, but the efficacy of those have been proven ineffective within the breast cancer population. Immediately after treatment, you are toast. You have very low levels of attention control. And so, doing a mindfulness course or doing CBT may be a bit of a struggle for some. So what do we need to do? We need to boost cognitive efficiency um, through perhaps some exercises and interventions that we have developed um, within our laboratory, tried and tested with anxiety, depression, rumination, worry, and we have found good reliable effects replicated um, over various laboratories. One way to exercise your um, cognitive efficiency, and this has been around for a, quite a while, the notion of an adaptive training program. An adaptive training program that exercises exactly those functions that are impaired, the functions that we saw were impaired, either hyper or hyperactive, a bit of a mix really. So, strengthening those neural connections, building those neural, new, neural synapses, we can move towards um, boosting that processing efficiency and reducing the compensatory um, effort. Now, this paradigm and its original form was shown to increase fluid intelligence and um, quite a good um, uh, moderate to, to good effect size has been reported across various studies. So your task is to match um, uh, a visual um, uh, the demonstration green box here um, to that of the trial before or the two trials back or three trials back um, and do the same for a letter that's spoken to you at the same time. So it's a dual task because you're doing two things at the same time. You're monitoring the location of the grid but you're also monitoring what's being spoken to you, auditory. It's quite challenging, really pushes the boundaries of the prefrontal cortex to, I'd like to say, to new horizons. So the greater the end, the more difficult. Um, you can undergo this training task for various amounts of time, across various kinds of days. Of course, vulnerable populations need more tailored types of interventions such as these, and we've managed to tailor them in terms of the time spent, the number of trials completed, um, and so forth. So I'm going to demonstrate a very simple version of that so that you can see whether you find a match or you don't. <clears throat> S H K so there was a position match, wasn't there? There was a green box match, but there wasn't an auditory match. Yeah? Who got that? <laughs> Nearly everyone. Very good. So, across training days, day one, for example, in this study, day 15, what we need to check is to see whether the level of N goes up. Whether participants get better at the task whether their cognitive function is improving on the task. And usually this is the pattern that we do see, that there's a linear increase. If there isn't a linear increase, there's no point doing anything else. You need to be able to explain changes post versus pre-intervention based on what participants are actually doing on the training task. And this is another example, for example, here they've trained for 20 days, from day 1 to day 20, you can see the linear increase going up. So I've just taken these typical pattern, a typical profile um, that we see across time training days. It's half an hour every day um, for 20 days or so. So the intervention protocol is something like this. At pre-intervention, you obtain measures of cognitive function, emotional vulnerability, 
any other neurocognitive function that you want to um, uh, assess, and then you have the intervention where you've got the uh, uh, a training group that does the adaptive version of the task and an active control group where you stagger on the one back. It's still a training, but it did, has much less demands on working memory. So the control group, the active control group, is absolutely key to have a good comparison to the training group. It's not perfect, but it's good. And post-intervention. So you measure participants' responses post-intervention. And what you expect to find is a difference post versus pre that you can explain through changes that you see here. You've got this group, two groups, and you want to find um, a group by time interaction. Of course, the benefits of training are key. Usually the literature looks at, some, looks at this distinction between near transfer, so do the benefits of training on your improved cognitive function. Can I find it on tasks that were similar to the ones that you did, the training that you did? Yeah? So does it generalise or is it just people get better on the task and that's it? And for transfer, does that improvement generalise to other things like emotional well-being? So that's real far transfer. A near transfer is the mechanism by which you can explain that far transfer. <clears throat> we have shown um, that this protocol, this intervention, can actually improve cognitive flexibility and filtering efficiency in depression. Um, this was actually one of the very first studies that we published. Max Owens, a PhD student of mine, um, who, who really was the one who got me into this. Uh, together with a colleague of mine at the University of Ghent, Ernst Costa, and then we ended up doing many, many studies and doing lots of papers together. Anything you see above the line is a change in post versus pre intervention as a function of the training. So the training group shows more improvement on uh, neural function, we've got neural efficiency and behavioural measures of working memory capacity. Um, and this was the first study of its kind that showed um, in depressed participants you can get neural efficiency as a function of training, which um, was quite impressive. And I still to this day find it difficult to digest. Um, we find similar um, effects with anxiety. So you can see improvements post versus pre training group always doing better than the control group. Um, this is resting state brain activity. We find that um, uh, the, the more you engage with the training, the better you become at the task, um, the lower your levels of self-reported anxiety, depression, not depression as such, rumination, worrying and anxiety. So these are taken from various kinds of papers where you find differences as a function um, uh, of improvement on the training task. We've looked at it in adolescence, um, where we found that at a one month follow up after the intervention, the effects were sustained. So these adolescents at the age of 11, could training be a protective mechanism against developing psychopathology? And we found that um, depression and anxiety were reduced as a function of training um, uh, in this population. So not only can increasing processing efficiency as a causal mechanism remediate psychopathology, but it can protect against the um, development. If you think of targeting individuals young, then using processing efficiency, cognitive efficiency, you've got this barrier, it's like a boot, it's like a vaccine, a cognitive vaccine against the development of high levels of psychopathology. So, a natural um, extension of this work, of course, is in vulnerable populations who have breast cancer. And we know, we've reviewed the extent of emotional vulnerability and cognitive difficulties that they do experience. So, um, we 
quite ambitiously ran a large-scale, longitudinal study. Um, Jessica Swainston, my PhD student, um, is behind this work. At pre-intervention, we had groups of women with breast cancer and um, uh, complete various kinds of questionnaires, emotional vulnerability questionnaires. Then they were randomly assigned to the training and the control groups and they were twist, tested three times, immediately after, at one month follow-up, and then at a longer time of 14 to 18 months follow-up. Um, we predicted that um, we would be able to reduce emotional vulnerability in the training group, so adaptive training can reduce emotional vulnerability. Um, we really were uh, a bit unsure what was going to happen at this long, um, longer time, but at one month we predicted that compared to the control we would find that. Um, so this, this is like a consort um, uh, overview of recruitment allocated to training, allocated to control number of participants. The follow-ups, we had 100% compliance at one month follow-up, which is excellent, and we had very, very good numbers at time four which was um, also quite good. We recruited via various charities like Breast Cancer Care, uh, Twitter and so forth, social media we recruited. So, across 12 days, the level of N went up. So they got better, participants got better in the adaptive training group as a function of time. As you can see, this blue line is going up, it means what? that level of N is increasing. So they're getting better on the training task at day 12 versus day one. And that line up there just shows the performance of the control group on the one back, which was stable, 98% stable. So did this transfer? Um, it transferred. The red line, dotted line, shows the anxiety-related uh, symptomatology um, across time for the control group and the, compared to marked reduction for the training group who underwent the adaptive training. And importantly, this stayed at, one, at the longest uh, follow-up. So follow-up one month, 14 to 18 months. Um, and as you can see, there is a there is more of a drop here, meaning that the effects of reduction in emotional vulnerability consolidate over time. What is it that such people are doing? What kinds of neural connections that are built, emphasized and exercised within the brain through that adaptive training that can be responsible for these? We didn't measure neurocognitive function. Rumination, a similar pattern, but effects were seen at, at the follow-up times, not so much um, post-intervention. And it makes sense, rumination is a highly cognitively dependent function. Um, and unique consolidation, changes in the brain don't happen overnight. They happen through experiences, the environment, emphasising those newly built connections. So the later changes are of more interest than the immediate ones. In fact, some say that the later changes you get are the more real ones than the immediate ones. So consolidation within the brain can explain some of these later effects. This is what we found quite interesting, um, and I'm going to read this. Without elicitation, many participants expressed the positive impact of training. They spoke um, how they would miss the daily challenge. Um, uh, it prompted them to give their brain a bit of, more of a workout on a regular basis, and uh, they found improvement in my memory. Others commented, it helped me in a funny way to stay concentrated on one thing, made me feel empowered and confident and was just what I needed. 
And we had numerous, absolutely numerous commas. This is just a, like, a drop in the ocean of um, uh, people saying good things about the training. And it's online, it's cost effective, you can do it at home, we monitor the progress um, and so forth. So uh, it's, it's important that they enjoy it um, rather than find it frustrating, just frustrating. So we need to explain these effects, yeah? So using neural um, uh, changes. And so we are going to be looking at um, how we can explain such changes through connectivity, increased connectivity um, in the brain um, and uh, looking at neural changes before and after training overall in functions um, that we discussed before. Um, in, I'm quite excited about these findings. We have completed a few more interventions. We've been very, very busy. Um, and one of them, we've just been looking at some of the data um, where we followed the same protocol but combined the MBAP training with expressive writing. Now, expressive writing has a long history in health and medicine. You write about your emotions, you vent, you exercise through um, emotion regulation, through writing, and the argument is that the expressive writing um, frees up working memory capacity. All of those negatively laden, horrific, intrusive thoughts I had in my head, um, well, I bring them down on paper. It's been used to um, increase math scores in schools, um, and there's very, very interesting research out there on expressive writing versus non-expressive writing. So I make a list of what I've done today, but without any emotional connotation. <clears throat> so again, we've got immediately at one month and 14 to 18 months follow-up. Let's see what we saw. This is just the grant. It's hot off the press. It hasn't been prepared for publication, so please don't quote me. I'm very particular about this kind of stuff. So we had four groups, those who did writing alone, 20 in each group or so, and those who did the combined. And very interestingly, what we find, uh, and I've really gone into this, um, but I, you know, I've checked this out, it's not fluke. Um, so here's the time between pre uh, intervention, post intervention, follow up one, one month, and follow up two. The blue line, let's cut to the chase, the blue line are the ones who did both the NBAP and the expressive writing. No changes you can see from pre, post to follow up one month. However, they continue to go down in terms of anxiety responses from follow-up one to follow-up two, which is the 14 months post-chemo. Um, compared with expressive writing alone, which doesn't do much. So the NBAP helps. The non-expressive groups, not much going on there. So there is some promise, this is very preliminary, there is some promise that writing exercises together with the MBAC, perhaps are loading on similar mechanisms within working memory. There are lots more to be discovered here. For example, how did the content of what they wrote moderate this, ex this reduction? We need to look at that. But this is just... A, a very, very simplified version of the graph. We have finished a study looking at the effects of MBAC and mindfulness meditation with colleagues in Oxford, again with uh, the breast cancer population, and we're excited to um, uh, look at the results um, of that study as well. So, we want to improve clinical outcome. That's the main aim. We want to improve. We want to make things easier for the NHS as well, um, and if this can have some implication in improving clinical outcome, then maybe it can assist this training, it can assist with other more traditional therapeutic programs out there, like mindfulness, like expressive writing, talking therapy, CBT, um, and so forth. 
It's cost effective, it, it's easy to administer, it's easy to monitor, and it's safe. So this, the final slide is a bit of a show-off slide, so um, I thought it would be nice to show, show off some of our work. So this is the paper that we had accepted in psycho-oncology, the first study, not the expressive writing one because we're still analysing that, but the one that showed continued reductions of anxiety and depression over time. Um, we're very, very proud. It took us a long time to get this out in, in this top journal, but it was worth it. The review was very, very helpful. Um, and it's, once it, it got out, it hit 12 media channels. Um, so this is just a snapshot of uh, some of the media channels that it was showcased. Uh, we, yeah, we were quite impressed they got the story right. Um, it's simplified, but the stories are, are right. Um, what do we do now? We need to maximise the intervention benefit. Is it one size fits all? Well, I'm not quite sure. There are lots of factors within breast cancer that can affect cognitive change across time. So we need to track the neurocognitive change from diagnosis to beyond active treatment, well into survivorship, using the methods that we know are reliable, have excellent temporal resolution, that we know have worked within the anxiety and depression literature. Now we need to translate that within the breast cancer population. And no other research has done this, or is doing this. Or maybe they'll do it once I've talked about it. Um, and we need to see how this change is moderated. Look, age, past history of anxiety and depression, very important. If you are prone to experience anxiety and depression, would you be more at risk of having cognitive difficulties? Of course, a lot of this will be retrospective, but a good perspective design can reduce the limitations of a retrospective um, uh, design. So this is a new poster that we'd like to publicise. Um, uh, please visit our centre. It talks about the Brick Centre, um, and I am very pleased that it is now a Birkbeck Centre. Um, our blog was uh, ranked the, the second best blog of breast cancer on the website, on the internet, and since that we are so new, um, it's, it's quite, uh, I think, an achievement. Um, so uh, we have a psychoeducational group, so if we translate this integrative centre, it looks something like this. We've got an integrative centre where we do um, multidisciplinary work, looking at new neurocognitive um, markers of cognitive vulnerability and emotional vulnerability and resilience. And basically because I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and um, that's what I've been trained in. <coughs> And then, of course, there's impacts, the translational impact of the work. Um, we are over 1,300 members. Um, we have regular uh, activities. These findings, cognitive neuroscience work, is translated. We uh, have live weekly uh, discussions. We have our blog, which has been ranked second um, in breast cancer blogs, breast cancer websites. Um, we have various projects that we run for members um, to showcase their resilience um, uh, throughout survivorship and we, we have exercises that uh, target uh, emotion regulation and emotion flexibility. They happen on Tuesdays and we have meetups and workshops. So um, we are growing fast. It's only a couple of years when I set up uh, um, the uh, interactive um, psychoeducational network, um, but we are growing by the day. Uh, in some ways, it's a good thing because people can find help. In other ways, it's a bad thing because more people are di well, <coughs> diagnosed with breast cancer. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And I think that given that we have this amazing organ, the brain is so susceptible to change, and this is our time to exploit it. Um, just going to list 
the amazing students without whom none of this work would be done. Um, in fact, I've had some amazing MSc, amazing PhD students um, who've contributed to this and will be contributing in the future. Um, many funding agencies who used to be very nice in the past. Not so much now, but we, we keep trying. Um, and, uh, and to us, so I want to thank you for, for listening. Time for a couple of quick questions. Right at the back. I was going to say that uh, this is fascinating. Uh, the breast cancer, is there a, a time age limit for the breast cancer which, which, uh, There's no age limit. No, age no so. Um, younger because I know some people that I thought they were younger in their 20s. Yes, absolutely. Yes. You can get breast cancer when you're in your 20s, when you're pregnant. Um, yes, way into adulthood. Uh, breast cancer doesn't discriminate. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. There is research, very limited though, on music therapy and art therapy for in breast cancer, um, especially secondary breast cancer actually, uh, but not its relation with working memory. But yeah, it's something that we need to look at, absolutely, because art is a form of expression um, and it's one that most patients find comfort in and become artists through their breast cancer journey and experience. Just thinking about the moderating effect on anxiety, that something like art therapy might support that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything struggling? Uh, going back to the physical side of things, uh, do you think HRT has any role to play? Um, I'm not a physician. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if there's any research showing a direct link, but of course that flares up the estrogen levels. Um, I mean, there are molecular studies and there are epidemiological studies. Molecular studies look at you know activity very very down to the cell and look at the effects of stress, chronic stress, and the impact on concentration of estrogen and so forth. And epidemiological studies which find it difficult to replicate those molecular studies. But um, if HRT increases the concentration of estrogen in the breast, then yes, it is a risk factor. Thank you.